Good morning, good morning. Saturday morning in Saxa. A little bit quiet so far. <laughs> Do we see any flashing lights? I don't know. I can't see down the street that far. Some days we see them, some days we don't. It's a little bit overcast. It's a really, really, really nice day. I've had the doors open here for a half an hour or so. No air conditioner, of course, no heater. Just natural. It's about the best time of year, weather-wise. Morning, good morning. I don't know if there are lights down there or not. I really can't see. Some days we can see them. Have they got the shutter pulled down a little bit? I don't know. Okay, what's the work today? It's supposed to be tracing. We might get to it if I have time or I suspect we're going to be sidetracked by other work this morning. And it's partly your fault. Your fault. It's a question of how much responsibility the chat wants to take here. We've had some experiences recently where when I've been doing a certain job, maybe I'm doing the color separations, whatever, members of this chat take great pride in watching what I'm doing carefully and keeping me on track. They might find a place that I've missed. You, I'm talking about you, you guys. You might find a place that I've missed and you let me know. What do we do in the case where a couple of weeks go by and I get a call, Dave, we have a problem and I look into it and I find out that the, the culprit is me, but I did the job on stream and there's a mistake in the job and the stream didn't catch it. <laughs> so how much culpability, how much liability do you have over in the chat? We've got a big one today. It's a really, really, really big screw up. A screw up big enough that Ome has gone up to their warehouse upstairs and they've sent me back 40, 50, 60 prints because we screwed up. Let me get this stuff out of the way and see if we can clarify what's going on. Oh, by the way, before we start that, here's the two key blocks for the December print. Before we get to the bad news, It's nothing to do with printing. <laughs> Someone's asking, isn't it, what test printing is about? This is, uh, okay, too many things going on. Okay, Bef before we start the problem fixing, we have the key block for KJ6. We talked about this. It turned out that there was a flaw inside the wood, which didn't really become apparent until after we printed it, and it may be showing on the border. So before we start printing, We've pulled a proof from it. Yesterday, Taran San and I played around with this. We pulled some proofs just of the key block. And it may show. So we'll have to get a little wedgie and, and fix that. You can see the rough outlines of the design. And uh, this is a proof we pulled just to line up the two blocks. In real life, the temple will be a regular black gray. And the outlines in the back will either be non-existent or there will be a faint gray. And it's color, color separation. And the color separations for this are difficult. And the color separations we got from the, from the designer didn't, didn't, actually, uh, didn't actually work. So I know it just saved me a huge amount of time. Taran San jumped into this this last few days. And he has spent a ton of time working out what to do with the color separations. Super, super helpful. And this is not a volunteer job for Taran. He's an employee now. He's working here. So this is his job. Junk on my desk. Humped any junk on my desk. Everything gets piled on here. There's the wood bowl. Oh, here are two of those color separations. And all Kawasaki-san has, has to get carving right away. So here are just two. Taran-san ran me up the first two yesterday. So I can paste them on the wood today. Maybe we'll do that this morning if we have time. I can paste them down, send them off to her, so she can have work Monday and Tuesday. And then in the meantime, he's going to get the rest of them done and we'll send them off to her so she can do the rest of the printing. Anyway, but none of that, all of that has to wait because we have a repair job. The print is... The 
print is the one that has become known as autumn decoration. And while it was under construction, we had uh, some confusion about the title. I chatted back and forth with Jen about what the title should be. He had some suggestions. We picked one of them. And then there was confusion here, great confusion here, about what the title was. It went round and around a couple of times. We sent out to the company to make the polymer plate for it. And the title on the polymer plate was wrong or it didn't match the title that we eventually chose for the print. No problem. We send the blocks out to Kubota-san. You know the deal anyway. Kubota-san doesn't normally do any of the embossing on the print. You've seen me do this many times. The prints come back from Kubota-san and I do the embossing of his name. And we did this on stream. I did it on stream while you watched and we were investigating the fact that her shoes had come out, her socks had come out nicely and whatever. But what nobody noticed, including me, was Do we have it? Has anybody noticed it yet? There's no title. And like, there's no title. Kubota-san normally puts the titles on, but we hadn't sent him the polymer plate. So he didn't even know it existed. He just made the print, never puts his name in, sends it all back to us. And on the stream here, 150 sheets or whatever, I put in his name and brain dead Dave here. And none of you noticed that the title was missing. The prints were wrapped, packed over to Ome for shipping, and they, on the first of this month, started to send them out. Bang, bang, bang. Maybe like 50, 60 people have already got the print with no title. Somebody let us know, Dave, where's the title this month? Wheels started to turn. It all came back to me, and I realized what had happened. Here is the polymer plate. We asked Ome to send back everything that you have. Stop shipping, cancel the shipping. So prints that were gonna go Thursday or Friday didn't get shipped. It's all come back to me. I have to open up each and every one, put the title on, pack them back up, send them back to Ome, and we'll be back and run. So I'm saying I never did the title job on stream. Well, no, of course, because I don't print the titles, but I do print the names there. Anyway, whatever, you can take this as seriously as you want. You guys, I screwed up. I'm taking the blame for this. I screwed up and you guys didn't catch it. You guys, you people, whatever. Anyway, it's easy enough. So first step now this morning, we have to make, make the plate and then get embossing. We, we. So yeah, so there are now, I don't know how many exactly, there are 40 or 50 people out there who have one of these prints without a title. Is this important? Is this a rare collector's item? What do we do about this? I don't know. I guess what we'll do is, and once we get this sorted out and the dust settles, maybe with together with next month's print for the subscribers, We'll put a note in with the next month's print saying, uh, let's put paper out today. There's no paper out today because nobody is here. Thank you for asking. And I, I keep missing the comment here. I'm sorry. There is no paper out today. Anyway, we'll send a note in with the prints next month, uh, letting people know what happened and giving it, giving it their option if they want to uh, get a title. There's the only answer is they'd have to send it back. I'll put the title in and uh, send it back to them with the, with the next month's print, you know. This paper is out. Thank you. Now there's another little twist to these titles and uh, actually 
this is not Kabuta-san's fault. He would have printed it had we sent it to him. But there is another twist. They're actually quite difficult to print compared to the name. And that's because of the location right next to the registration marks. Let me show you just one sec. Let me get this board up and running. The print, of course, it's going to go face down. The block to print the names is, of course, over here. We've got our registration mark here in the corner and here, and then we print. And the one for the name is well away from the registration mark. But on these prints, some idiot decided at the beginning of this project to put the title on the right-hand side at the bottom of each one. And that means it's right here right tucked into the registration mark. So we've got to put the polymer plate here on the block and that really gets in the way of putting the paper in the registration mark. Can't be helped. That's the title for next month's print, the one we just saw, the one with the temple and the snow. And here Dave's about to lose it, so we'll put it in my box here. So, where's it supposed to go? Outside, I think it was dogs outside, wasn't it? There's uh, the coffee shop across the street, and recently some lady has been going in there for coffee every morning at about this time. And she leaves her little yapper outside, tied to a pole. If we had the camera faced the other way, we'd see it right now. And uh, maybe it's a new dog for her, and the, the dog hasn't yet got used to the uh, got used to the routine to learn that it, it it will be picked up in half an hour or so, and it hasn't been abandoned forever. But at the moment, it's thinking that it's been abandoned, and it yaps and barks at everybody who walks by. Just a second while I get this lined up. If I get this in the wrong place, I'll be messed up here. Let's put that there. Okay, so it's going to go right in there, about half a millimeter up. Okay, double-sided tape.
In other news, not sure what other news there is. The shop is, of course, I know we, we just, this is a recording, a recording. The shop's extremely busy. We're kind of breaking records day by day, week by week. I know we're really, I have no idea how long this is going to last, but uh, the volume of tourists coming through the room now is just uh, incredible, absolutely incredible. Okay, let me get this right. If I get this wrong, we need it to be right there between those two black marks up a millimeter. There we go. And what I'll do also before we start embossing this is I've got to cut off the back of this plate. The plate has sharp edges and as I'm rubbing on the front of this, it's possible I'll hit those sharp edges and it might leave a mark in the print itself. So I've just got to bevel, just got to bevel off the edge of these, the edges of this plate. Someone's asking, is there any updates on the audit? No, we're just waiting. I know the week went by, Monday all the way through until Friday, with no, no comments and no, uh, no contact from the tax department. So no, I don't have anything to there. I will, of course, absolutely report to you what happens. And, uh, if anything, <laughs> I said, I don't. Should I be worried? The longer it goes the between updates, is that bad news or good news? I mean, if they were going to let us go, would they have let us go after a couple of days? The fact that they've spent at least a week auditing our books, I mean, inspecting our books, you know, the data that they took home. Is that bad news or good news? I honestly have no idea. I really, really, really have no idea. But yes, I will, of course, keep you informed about what's going on. Okay, I think we've got this ready. Let's zoom out, let's get a camera position, and let's get some work done, finally. What do we need to see here? I need to see the, oh, okay. The way this is gonna work. So let's get that one out of the way, one sec. Here's how this is gonna work. The prints in the Ome storeroom are in this format. This is the way they go out to collectors. Inside the postal envelope, whatever, there's this. And this is wrapped in, in plastic to keep it okay from the rain. There's our barren seal and the number of the print in the series. This cardboard, which is meant to be disposed, it's of course just for shipping to keep things tight while it's being shipped. This is the product that the subscribers receive. It's a folder with the title of the print and it's a trifold. There's a story in English and Japanese talking about what we're doing here. It might be commenting about the design, it might be commenting about some of the construction methods. They vary all over the place. The print is held inside with photo corners. Little very nice light thin Japanese photo corners. So people could take it out for framing, there's no nothing glued. And an important point is the reason it's a trifold instead of just a buy like this is because you can't put toner on top of a print like this. Over time, the black lettering could transfer to the print or perhaps even while it's being mailed, if it got squashed and stamped, the black would transfer. So I'm sure people are doing the common sense thing. They're closing it and closing it like this. But the point being, I have to take each one of these out now. I have to open these up one by one. I've got a stack of them on my bench here. <laughs> I have a stack of them. They have to be opened one by one. Stamped. Do I do the write-up? Yes, of course I do the write-up. Absolutely. Who else could do that? It's my job here. Let's pull this one out into the registration marks. We still haven't tested this, so hang on a sec. Maybe some light might help here. Let's have a look. Uh, 
the ones in the stack, they are not yet in the plastic envelopes. We don't keep prints in plastic in the storeroom. It's not good to keep them stuffed in plastic forever and ever and ever. So they go into the plastic at the last step before being posted out. The subscription prints all upstairs. They're all mounted in their folders like this, but they are not locked into the plastic yet. It would help if I had a rubbing tool here. Let's try this one and see what's happening. Have I got it lined up properly? In fact, what I think I might do actually is let's do this backwards. Because I'm left-handed and there's no moistened paper involved here, let's put it in the marks, line it up there, and I can now print with my left hand right here. And we have our missing title. And then back it goes. So this is not going to be horribly interesting work today, I'm sorry, but it really, really, really has to be done. Here we go, in, in in, in, and back into me box. Next one. I think actually I'd like the lettering to be a tiny bit higher. I think I've got it a bit low. I want it about half a millimeter higher up. So I think I'm going to move this. I'm going to slice this off here. Put the paper down just a little bit more. There we are. This is what should have been done a couple of weeks ago. So thanks for your patience with this. We now have to get this running. Now that the prep is done, I can do this quickly. I think, what time is it? 8.24. Let's see if we can roll. Actually, what I should do is I'll just put them in like this. We can, the staff, when they get here to work today, can put them in carefully. I'll just flop them back into each folder. The shop staff today can put them in carefully. I'll just take them out, put the name on, and today's shop staff can put them carefully back inside each one. Better than me sitting here stumbling with them. Let's do that.
I'll do that part. In it goes, just like this. Bang, the shop staff can do it. Let's roll. Someone's asking, Dave, what is the book? What is the book? What are we talking about? Give me a hint. What is the book? I'm sorry, I don't understand the reference. What are we talking about? There's no book. I mean, these are the cards. This is the, the shipment that's going out to the customers. There's a protective card and a story that goes with each print. There's, there's no book here. Sorry if there's confusion. Tourists coming down the street, heading for the airport, or coming in, who knows. This time of day, it's common both ways. People coming in from the airport and people heading out. But to the ones who arrive, their flights arrive at this time of day. They've got a problem because most hotels don't let people in at 8 o'clock in the morning, of course. Hotel check-in time is going to be in the afternoon for most people. So those who have arrived on a morning flight, it's always tough. And we get them here in the shop sometimes. People have come in at Narita. They're heading for a hotel, maybe in Asakusa somewhere, and they've got these giant bags with them. So we actually, I mean, this is not an advertising, this is not a promise. But but we will let people leave their bags here, you know. They've got, they're checking in at the Richmond Hotel across the street or something. And they've arrived here in the morning. So leave your bags here, it doesn't matter. Come pick them up later on. But this is, we don't do a bag drop service. <coughs> but it is a problem for people that arrive on a morning flight. So in the Kyoto station yesterday morning, <laughs> or yesterday afternoon, yesterday here in Asakusa was crazy. I just keep saying the same thing, but it's always true. I've never seen it so busy. Last week I probably said the same thing. This week it's busier. I guess I've forgotten. Before the pandemic it must have been really, really busy here because they tell us that tourist numbers haven't actually recovered yet. I can't believe that because the numbers of people that walk down this street in the evenings Friday night, last night, and they were at it well past midnight. The bars closed. Hopi Dodi closed about 10.30. Didn't make any difference. There were people standing outside on the street. The hotel across the street here, there's people hanging around outside. 11, 11.30. I got up to go to the bathroom last night. I don't know what time, 12, 12.30. There's people out there chatting and drinking and having a good time. It's a very friendly kind of environment though. It's not sort of a rowdy bar district where people are lying in the gutter and barfing everywhere and stuff like that. It's really, really, really friendly and cool. The one last night, there was, the problem for me, there was a young woman with a really high-pitched voice and Dave here is sleeping. But it wasn't, a, there was no rowdiness or drunkenness or, or you know, 
smashing stuff up. It's just people hanging out. And in the morning, when I get up here Saturday morning, there's no, there's nobody lying in the gutter. There's no, you know, there's no, I don't have to wipe the, the pee off my door and stuff like this, you know. The other thing that I find sort of different from what I remember about traveling and, and tourism and stuff like that, quite a large, well, not quite a large number, there is a case, cases where a bunch of these people who are here drinking and stuff in the evenings, they've got a baby buggy with them and they've got a kid and the kid is like three months, six months, one year, two years old. And these are people hanging out at a bar at like 10, 30, 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock at night and there's a kid there. and. I guess whatever, it works. Either the kid is asleep or it isn't. It's walking around and stuff like this. In my, in my generation, whatever, we would never have like thought of doing that, you know. But it is, it's a thing now. People uh, stay out late with, uh, with rugrats. And sometimes the kids are actually, you know, like uh, five or six years old or whatever, they're sitting there and they've got a juice or something and mom and dad are drinking and it's 10.30 at night. I could never have understood that, not at all. It just seems okay, the kids are kids, you know, I guess, I don't know. People leave kids at the shop too. They've tried. <laughs> They've tried. We don't. We don't run a babysitting service, of course not. What we do with the kids thing here, I don't. Should I talk about this, or maybe people will come to expect it? I don't know. What we've learned is uh, over the over the years. A common scene is people who are traveling with kids. Okay, the, the one in a, in a snuggly, whatever, the, per, the baby is sleeping or whatever, nothing we can do with this. Another type is when the people come in the door, there's a baby buggy. And we instantly take a look. And if the kid's sleeping in the baby buggy, we instantly, shh, 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 shh. And everybody's kind of, so we lower the sound level. And the person with the baby buggy goes like a soundless thank you. And they park the kid here. And everybody sort of behaves really quietly for a while to avoid waking this, this kid up in the buggy, you know. Then if you move this up an age level, there's another case where uh, a common one is there'd be a couple of kids, maybe four, five, six years old, preschool type kids. And they are gonna be, within a minute or two, they're bored out of their minds. The mom and dad wanna spend some time looking at prints and the kids are bored. When it's teenagers, no problem. They got their phones, they just sit in the corner, do their phone, that's no problem. But the kids who are, you know, like around preschool or elementary school age, they're, they're bored. And what we do is we make a quick judgment call. If it looks like the parents are gonna stay for a while, if the parents are really sort of looking in the prints, I will come up to the kids or one of the ladies will come to the kids and say, hey, come with me. And the parents are like, what's this? And I, I look at the parents, relax, relax, trust me, trust me. I say to the kids, come with me to the back room. We got a back room here where we used to do the print parties. It's wide open. We're not taking the kids out of sight into the back room. It's wide open. The see what's going on. And the parents, of course, they, they watch what's going on. And I grab the two kids and take them in the back room. And we've got some uh, jigsaw puzzles, uh, handmade jigsaw puzzles. We've got a couple of, uh, we've got an alphabet snake in Japanese. We've got a few games, stuff that I made when I had my own kids around the house. And we've prepared these in the back room here. So we, uh, you know, I, I pull a jigsaw puzzle. I say jigsaw puzzle. I don't mean a little tiny piece of jigsaw. It's a wooden puzzle. It's a, it's a zoo puzzle. There's 20 animals cut out of wood, and they have to nest together into a shape. And I've got a shtick. I pull the puzzle out of the shelf, and the kids at this point they like really don't know what's going on. I say, do you like like animals? And they say, yeah. And I pretend to trip, and I dump the animal thing right in front. Oh my God! I've broken it. You got to put it back together. And I give them a couple of instructions, and out we come. And if it all works really well, the kids take 5, 10, 15 minutes. The parents are out there browsing for prints. The kids have a good time. The parents buy a ton of prints. 
and occasionally it doesn't work, what will happen is the dad, who is, you know, whatever, he's, he wants to make sure we're not messing around with his kids, whatever, the dad comes over, looks over into the room, he's interested in this, he kicks his shoes off, comes up onto the mats and kids are out of there. The dad sits there looking at the, doing the puzzle and the kids are pushed aside or they're, he's pretending to do it together but it's really become his thing. And it's good fun. And then bang, 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 five minutes it's all over. He comes out into the shop and the dad starts browsing for prints now and now the puzzle's all finished. So we got, we've got a few of them here, you know. One that is really fun, it's an alphabet snake. You've all seen them, you know what they are. It's a, it's a 26 pieces, A, B, C, and they all fit together, blah, 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 to make a snake, whatever. Well, I've got one here that's using the Japanese syllabary. I also at home, I have an alphabet snake that I made for my kids, but there's a Japanese, and it's Iro ha ni ho he to chidi nu ru o. It's a famous old poem that uses all the syllables of the Japanese alphabet. And we have it here as a snake. And the kids can't read Japanese. So how do they do it? Every two pieces have a unique shape and border. And you have to do it by shape, not by reading the characters. If, if, you, if you can't read. You know. Japanese person can read it. They know the poem. It's no problem for them. So yeah, Mokohankan Daycare. The zoo puzzle is, uh, it's really actually well done. It's well done and it's fun. And if I had five minutes to spare, I should commercialize it. We should get a factory to make it, start selling it, run a patent on it. If I had five minutes to spare. Yeah, we did it on stream, I think. Yeah, that's right. That's right. That's right. I'd forgotten about that. John. John did it. Did you, which one did you do, John? Was it the zoo puzzle or did you do the alphabet puzzle? I don't remember. Was it the animals, John, or the, or the letters? The snake puzzle. Okay. Yeah, next time we got to do the, the, the uh, animals. Mokohank on daycare for John Becker. John was not sleeping in his buggy. <laughs> so <laughs> I've got tons of wooden puzzles, you know, tons of them. Before starting the printmaking business and end of it, I was making prints as a hobby, but before booting it up as a business, I ended up making wooden toys. I, we started in, I think, 1987, and I canned it in 1989. It was just becoming unbearable. Too many orders, too much trouble, too many people. So I started wooden toys, and it exploded, but just, just no. I didn't want to become a business owner. It was really funny. When I did my spreadsheet, the toys were taking off and the prints weren't. I hadn't tried selling prints yet, but toys, the orders for toys were pouring in. So my life was going in a direction where I sort of really hadn't expected it to go. And I sat down with a little spreadsheet. This is on paper. There's no computer here. This is 1989 or something. And I put the spreadsheet up, the, the wooden toy thing and the printmaking thing and the English teaching thing, which I was still doing to, you know, feed my kids. And the reason I rejected the toy business, even though it was going gangbusters, was because I didn't want to have an employees and run a business. I wanted to work all by myself, peacefully and quietly. So I hit, killed the toy business and focused on the printmaking business, even though I wasn't making a living at the time. And here I am now, 30 employees, noise, chaos.
halfway through I think, sorry about this today. Anyway the alternative would have been tracing so it still wasn't carving yet. Carving won't start yet for a couple of weeks. Completely about my stomach. Is my stomach complaining? I haven't had breakfast. It was a, it was a quick get going morning. There's no pool today, it's Saturday. So perhaps my stomach is complaining, I'm sorry. Do we have apprentices? No, we have employees, we have workers at different levels of skill. We don't take apprentices per se. We would love to have more workers, more printers specifically, but we can't, uh, there's no structure in place where we can take you on as a prospective person and work with you until you turn out to be a printer. We've learned over the years that because most people quit, it's impossible, impossible for us to make that kind of in investment. So what we do is this, you learn first, you get good at it, you get good at it enough so that we can hire you and then we're up and running. And that might sound extremely unfair or ridiculous, that's not an apprenticeship if you have to teach yourself, but this job is one that you need self-direction to be able to do anyway. And if you're not able to, to self-organize your life and to get some uh, skills built up by yourself, then you're not the kind of person that we would want to hire anyway. It sounds a bit paradoxical, I'm sorry. You'd have to dig around our history and our videos and our website to learn more about it. But it really is a self-directed craft. And we need people who are competent by themselves without having to have lots of direction. And the simplest way to find such people is to tell them you learn by yourself and when you're ready, come on over and have we got work for you. I'm simplifying the thing by saying it that way, but it's the thing. I can't take a greenhorn and sit him in the room here and say, okay, here we are, step one, pick this tool up and let's try this. Reason is, one, we don't want the kind of person who needs to be told what to do and have everything explained to them. And two, there has to be a filter there. We have to know that you're going to like this and enjoy it. And the only way to do that is for you to do it for quite a long time first. And then if you are actually enjoying it, and you like this job, then we can talk about work. I'm sure it's a, it's a long, complicated process, all trying to be explained in, in, in just a few words. A good example, for example, might be Karen, who is on the stream here. She's not an employee of mine and isn't looking, isn't looking to become an employee of mine. The point being, though, she took the information that we've put out there, together with her own drive and desire, and ended up being a very competent person who can make prints. And this is what we're looking for in our own employees, the same kind of... Uh, interest and self-desire self and drive. In Karen's case, she's not trying to make a living out of this right now, so it's okay. But if she were a person, for example, that wanted to, to just do this as a craft and wanted to make a living, there would be work here for her. That's not her goal in life. She wants to be an artist and make individual prints and not slave away making 600 copies of every one all the time. In the old days, of course, it was apprenticeship. I know. In the old days, there was tons of work at every level. There was work at a simple level. People were making uh, food wrappers with woodblock printmaking. So there was work for a youngster on the first day. So the system in place was a bit different from what I'm describing now. There was ongoing workshops. There's an empty bench. Somebody has retired. You need a new kid. Some kid just drops in. He's sent into the workshop by his parents who heard there was a space available. The kid sits down. Day one, he's printing food wrappers. If he likes it and feels competent at it and gets better at it, they will gradually give him better, more difficult, more interesting work, and away you go over a period of years. 
If it turns out that he doesn't like it or isn't competent at it or gets bored by doing this, he would leave at an early stage while he's still doing food wrappers. So it was all very self-organizing and self-arranging, but it assumed that there was lots of work at every level of the craft, and that's not the case anymore. I need people, it's a paradox, I need people who can do this. And you can't do this without a few years of experience. But I don't have beginner work printing food wrappers that you can train on. What did I learn? I was self-directed, self-driven. There was no job. Of course not. I just wanted to try making prints. Made a few prints as a hobby. Made a few more as a hobby. Hey, this is cool. I like this. Study this. Get going at it. Tried to gather information. There was no internet, no books, no teachers. But it's very much, you can figure it out by doing it. If you're, a, if you're that kind of person. You're warming up for the time check. Time check, time check. Nine o'clock on a Saturday. Okay, we're nearly done here. I think it's about nine more copies. We will then switch to Paste down the hunch the mode. Might even get a peel, I don't know. Paste and peel, we'll see. Perhaps you can start in the shipping department, do this, learn to size, then do back. <laughs> Assuming we had a you know multi-hundred employee company with departments, yeah, I guess so. <laughs> Everybody's got a job here. One of the ladies in the shipping department, Ishigami-san, she was one of the first employees back in 2011. Ishigami-san was hired as a trainee printer. Turned out that she wasn't really so suited for that. We don't need to go into details. It doesn't matter. People have different skill sets. But here she is, 12 years later. She's one of our main shippers in Ome. So that sort of worked in that sense. Six more. I am hungry. So, somebody's saying the Mokohankan School, that would be a viable business. There would be a business model here. Whoa, I am hungry. Sorry about that. There would be a viable business model running a printmaking school, but we just don't have the resources. We're already, every single person in this building is struggling to get the work done on any given day. And people who have skill at printing, I'm not going to have them sit there teaching beginners what to do. They're going to make prints. I know Terry McKenna up in Karuizawa, that's his business model. He is a printmaker. He makes his own original art. But the problem with many modern printmakers making original art is it's kind of difficult sometimes to make a living. So he is a teacher. He teaches. He has day classes, uh, residencies, books. He's published his books. They're doing very well in the shop. He put his, his books in the shop a few weeks ago and they're doing very, very well. Soka, someone's talking about the picture on the website. Yeah, I, I guess I'll have to ask Watanabe-san to shoot it again. Yes. 
So yeah, we should replace the one on the website. But actually sometimes, you know, if you go on that page on the website that has all the prints in this series, do they all have titles? Because sometimes we just grab one quickly from the proof copies and shoot it and put it on the website. So it's possible they don't all have names on them. The name of the person doing classes, it's Terry McKenna, M-C-K-E-N-N-A. If you Google him, Kadoizawa, he's here uh, near Tokyo, about 35 minutes by train outside of Tokyo. He now does print parties four times a week, Tuesday morning afternoon and Thursday morning afternoon. He's picked up, he and his wife, they've picked up from where we used to do print parties. And that's available now in Kadoizawa. Terry McKenna. Somebody's got it. Good. He's got a bit of a confused website, like somebody else I know. But it's in there. If you keep poking around, you'll find the classes. He's also a real nice guy. Competent, gets stuff done. And a nice guy to boot. Last one. So by the origin video, I've got to get part three done to show. Part one and two are there. Part three is not done. It's all script, not scripted out. It's, you know, it's planned out. Oh, speaking about video. Okay. That's done. Thank you very much for your patience during that long, onerous chore. We now get down to a little bit of printmaking work. Speaking about video, YouTube. I got an email from YouTube the other day. I got two emails. One was your monthly channel update. Here's how many new subscribers you have. Here's what's happening. Here's what's happening. Check your analytics. And then I got an email of, uh, just a, actually a couple of hours after that, which I first thought was spam. It's an email from the YouTube, uh, whatever, creators, you know, the people who connect with the creators. Is that a bus tour happening outside? What's going on there? Look at that. What do we got? A whole bunch of, there they are. A bunch of foreigners heading down the street. I got the email from YouTube saying, we have a new deal channel memberships and for you especially for you right now if you act now they're talking to me we will give you a 65,000 yen bonus if you turn on channel memberships within the next couple of weeks and they then went on to say and if you reach 30 channel subscribers within 30 days we will give you another cash bonus of 65,000 yen. That's actually no big deal. It's about 500 bucks. So they're, they're going to give me, <laughs> they, they are encouraging me to do this by offering me a cash up front. It's not 45,000. John, you got too many zeros. I said 65,000 yen. You've got too many zeros. It's about 450 bucks. John, you're a professional Japanese traveler. Get with the program. You're losing some credibility here. <laughs> anyway, anyway, anyway. I am not in the slightest bit interested in turning on channel memberships. I don't even know what they are. So someone's asking me, what are channel memberships? I do not know. Perhaps somebody else can fill us in here. I don't know. I guess what they're doing is normal YouTube videos have ads. It's like Twitch, right? People can, normal Twitch, people become uh, subscribers, members, paid subscribers to a channel. I get X percent, Twitch gets X percent, and I guess you don't see any ads. Is this what YouTube has got now? Channel memberships. You pay me a monthly fee to be allowed to watch my videos? Like, is that for real? I'm nervous, I'm nervous, I'm nervous. YouTube means very much to us. YouTube helps us so much. YouTube drives tons of business to us. 
I am in debt to YouTube more than I'm in debt to anything else on this planet. Our life, our free and easy life that we have now with customers pouring through the shop is all due to people watching our YouTube videos and then coming in here. So I'm not in any way dissing YouTube. I'm, I'm really, I'm nervous, nervous, nervous. I just do not want it to change. And it's going to change, obviously. That's the way it goes. I don't think this is YouTube Premium. Is there an explanation somewhere over there on what channel memberships mean? Because I just don't know. I'm sorry. Monthly subscription for no ads, but also exclusive content. So I have to make some content and tell other people they can't see it. I do not want to do that. But I guess YouTube is trying to get it up and running because they're offering me, you know, offering me cash to do it. No, thank you. Okay, how much do we need to explain what is going on here now? Because I guess there's people watching who don't have a clue what I'm suddenly doing now. Let me just get this couple of things cut and then I will do a quick explaining run through. I'm sorry about the noise. I am really hungry. I really, 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 really am hungry. But it would be worse if I eat, so I don't know what's worse. Okay, let's try and give a quick, concise précis of what I'm doing here. We're making a new print which will involve having key lines, a black block and color blocks. I don't have an image of the print to show you, it's still sort of top secret, whatever. The first stage of the process, transferring the artist's lines to the block and carving is done. We have stage one, the key block done. You can get the idea. It's a shape carved on wood, and where's the, where's the print that I took from it? I already showed you this this morning. So where, where's the print that I took from it? I've already lost it. I'd lose my head if it wasn't bolted on. Here it is. Okay, sorry, sorry, sorry. So we have a block with some lines carved on it prints looking like this. Now we need colors to go on this. So we need to make color blocks. Maybe there's going to be a green tree or blue water or a red bridge, stuff like this. And in order to carve those color blocks, we have to transfer these lines onto the next piece of wood. And the way we do it is the way we see here. We have a special piece of paper that is very thin, kind of like tracing paper, gumpy paper and it's temporarily glued to a piece of stronger paper. Yesterday, Taran San and I, we put pigment on this, and I printed this sheet on the key block by putting the paper into the registration corners. Key block then goes aside. We now cut new registration corners on a blank block, and you can see where this is going. If I put the paper in the same registration marks and glue it down, the lines have been transferred from the key block to the color block. And what we do here is 
we decide for each color block which areas we want to be kept. Now, this area is going to be a pigment that will print the bridge tone and the temple tone. And actually, probably it'll print in vermilion red, which is the same color you see here, although that's not part of the game. And by doing this, we've transferred the data. It's, let's just do it. Let's paste it down. Back off a bit so we can see what's going on. Oh, also, what did Taransan choose? No, this is three millimeter Gampi. Put your scorecards away. There is no peel happening here today. I'm going to paste this down, pull off the back sheet, and we are done. No peel. What do we got? Nine o'clock on a Saturday. <laughs> are you just showing off now? Are you running up the score? Running up the score. I thought that wasn't really a thing to do, but <laughs> okay. <laughs> Let's keep going here, 902. Water first to moisten the wood so that the glue doesn't go too far deeply into the wood. Although in the case of the light paste I'm going to be using here, it doesn't really matter. If we're using a strong wood glue, this water stage is very important because if not, the wood glue moves into the surface of the wood and it's then very difficult to print from it later. We're going to use instead some patented honey. As in not really honey, but a mucilage. This is a Japanese school kids mucilage glue. It works just fine for this stuff. It's not really strong, but it's enough to bond that very thin paper to the wood and it washes off easily once we're done. I'm a tiny bit too light here. Too much is not good, not enough is not good. And to recap again, we're going to put the paper carefully, carefully in the registration marks. Down she goes. The unneeded backing sheet, having done its job, is now gone and done. Thank you very much. It just held, because this transfer paper is so light and thin, the backing sheet held it stable while we were doing this. And as I said, there's going to be no peel. Let me just get rid of the extra on the edge here to make this thing presentable. And no peel. This is three millimeter gumpy. And as you can see, it's totally visible. The carver, Kawasaki-san, is going to do this job. She will have no problem whatsoever. Look at this. We do not need a peel here. And I sure hope Taran-san hasn't missed any spots. I'm a little curious what's happening up in this corner here. Taransan, are you watching? Should there be some red here? I don't know. What about in here? I get at the top, that's snow. The top of the bridge doesn't have red on it because there's a bunch of snow sitting on the bridge. So I get that. Maybe that's what's happening here. Maybe there's snow. I'll look it over before we send it out. Okay, there's the front side. Let's do the back side.
we use both sides of our blocks and the back of this one is going to be an easy block. It's tree trunks and maybe there's a bit of brown on the, on the bridge and on the temple. Most of this print is going to be tones of blue and green. The two blocks you're looking at here are highlight blocks. The temple and bridge will be red and they will be brown tree trunks. Most of the rest of it's going to be cool, cool, cool. Taransan did that work off camera, so of course I don't think we can blame the chat for any missing parts this time around. see what's going on. Okay, same thing again. Dab of water first, just to, so the glue doesn't get too sticky. Oh, good morning, good morning. That's right, 9.10. Yes, it's Sadako here.
。ああ、どうも。あ、どうも。いいどどくるみいいんですか。百ぐらいですか。あ、違います。はい。オッケーどうも。はい。ありがとうございます。メオマネゲンサタデーモーニング。How we get the same situation as Thursday stream then? The mailman has brought in a box. Do we crack it or do we go to our not very well prepared show and tell today? Did not expect that. Not sure what's in there. We've been buying tons of stuff from all of our usual three main supply sources. One is、uh, Yahoo Auctions, of course, you've seen some of that stuff. That's a supply for us. We also get things these days from Medukari. It's another website where people buy, their own, sell, buy and sell their own stuff. And then, of course, we have access through、uh, the dealer auctions that are going on here in town as well. That's become very, very, very competitive recently. Very much so. Might not be a good idea to tell everyone where you're getting your stock. It's not top secret stuff. I mean, this is where prints come from. The dealer network is in the background. Nobody out there has access to that. Auctions are public websites, whatever, you know. I can't hide this stuff. Dealer auctions are nothing to do with this stream. We, can't, we don't go into that. You guys have nothing to do with that. As I just mentioned, that, well, they're all, they're all very competitive. <coughs> Yahoo Auction these days also is getting very, very, very competitive. Okay, again, no peel. Taran san has used the three millimeter gumpy paper. There's no peel necessary. Later this afternoon, this will be wrapped up and sent out to our carver in Kobe, ano, Noriko Kawasaki. There will be a full set. There's not going to be just one of these. I think Taran san said there's 12 faces. I can't remember. I think he said there's going to be six pieces of wood, two sides. I don't remember. He, he did the thing himself yesterday, so I wasn't involved. But there we are, that's the basic process. Okay, it's 9 15 on a Saturday. Let's do a show and tell. As I said, I haven't prepared a specific special show and tell today. I was going to dig back into the folder of prints that I made when I first came to Japan, but we've just been. Given a gift box, let's have a look and see what's inside one of them. I'll need to widen my desk here, get rid of my lamp, you know, the usual routine, because these look like big packages. Let's see what we've got here. You s h o t Someone says, is the afternoon better to visit Dave or is it high demand every hour? I have no idea. It changes day by day. It, there's no pattern. Some days the morning is crazy, the afternoon's quiet. Other days the morning is sleeping and afternoon goes berserk. I cannot give you any advice on this. I just don't know. If we, we would love to know so we could arrange our staff. It's random. Come during business hours. That's all I can say. Okay, let's have a look at this.
Oh, look at Good morning. We're still live for a while here. So, not alive, this. I don't think this is ASMR unboxing. It's too noisy. How many layers? That was one. Let's have a look. I think I know what this is. Yes, 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 yes. Tokaido prints. Tokaido prints. I'm not sure how old these are. Let's have a look. I know this set. This is published by uh, the Yu Yudo Company. This is back when they were still doing a nice job. This would be maybe 60s or 70s. That's all I can say. It's a bit beat up, maybe early 60s. It's possible it's the late 50s, but I don't think so. Let's say 60s. And it's a Tokaido set in slightly reduced size. They published this thing in two different versions. They published a full large size Tokaido set. And this is a slightly reduced size. We here at Mokohankan, we call it the medium Tokaido. There's actually four very common sizes for this. The real size, slightly reduced like this, then what we call the small size, A4, and then postcard size. And this looks like, I'd look at it. This, it's unopened. Absolutely unopened. Somebody would have bought this as a set in the 60s. It might have been by subscription, one package each month or every couple of weeks, or it could have been bought as the whole thing. And it's in the original plastic, stuck in plastic for 50 years. My God. Let's have a look at a couple of them. For us, sets like this now, the, the step number one is simply to save the thing. Quite often, there's mold, there's foxing, being wrapped up in a damp environment with no, uh, no airflow is deadly for prints, absolutely deadly. So our first job, regardless of what we're going to do with this, first job will be to open this up, throw away all the plastic, just get this stuff opened up to the air. I can feel it. It's damp. This is October. This thing is in some, came from some damp house somewhere. You're about to be saved. Yeah, it would have been subscription. Each one of these packages, they would have got one package each, each month or every two weeks. And each package will have two prints inside. That's a set of 55, 56, 58 prints when you include the table of contents. So it would have been something like a 20, 27, uh, 27 week process or whatever. Here we go. They're glued in, unfortunately. And these look okay. This is not bad. Yu Yu Do is really unreliable. Sometimes they're wonderful, sometimes they're god awful. These look okay. Registration is decent. It's not magnificent. It's nicely, carefully well done. That's that white stuff. That's the backing paper. So my job now with this, or, or the staff today, we'll open this up and have a look later on. Our job first is to go through the whole thing and first see are there any uh, are there any is there any foxing or molding or prints that don't match the rest it will be rare 
to get through the whole thing nicely. If they are all okay, then we have a conundrum. Do we leave it as a full set or do we break it up? Really clean, good full sets are rare. So for the most part, we leave them like that. We will put this into our catalog as a full set of Tokaido prints. But having said that, we know that, oh, they put the sun in. There's two versions of this, the version with the sun and the version without the rising sun. These guys have put it in. In most Tokaido prints, the sun is not there. As I said, the problem comes, even if we want to keep it as a full set, what do we do? We can't put it back in this packaging. The packaging is terrible paper. It's not acid free. Keeping them all wrapped up like this is not easy for people to browse. So what we've developed is an alternate way of keeping these sets together. I will take all the prints out of the packaging. We will actually, hold your breath, we will tear this apart and peel the print off the back, preserving the print but removing the packaging. We can't preserve both sides. We then take the prints and we put them in those black albums that you've seen, clear files. And for a set of Tokaido prints, it will take two of those files. And that makes the series, one, uh, protected carefully, no more plastic wrapping. Two, it makes it accessible. You can browse the thing and look at the prints. Keeping this a full set like this, nobody can browse the damn thing. To look at a print, you've got to do what I'm doing now. Pull off the plastic, open it up, open it up, look at it for a few minutes, close it up, do it all again for the next one. It's just not browsable. But I think we have a nice set here. famous character, what is he doing on the other side of the river there? Everybody's asking, what is this guy doing? I think he's adjusting himself, but I don't know. <laughs> what do I know? I don't know. <laughs> this looks like a decent set. They've done a re reasonable job here. The black, to my taste, is too black, too strong. The black should be a more subtle gray instead of being a rich black. But this is very common for post-war reproductions. Good gradation on the top. Very nice. We can't go through all 55, of course. Let's just look at a few more, see how it is. Let's jump part way down the set. Let's move these out of the way. What's also really, really, really common is you saw the first couple, they've obviously been opened, the label was missing from one of them. As the set goes down into the set, we get to a situation where almost certainly the people have never opened them. You know, they, they start their subscription, they get a couple going, they open the first one, and the rest of them just never, ever, ever get looked at. Oh, Mariko, this one's a famous design, you know. We've talked about this before. This restaurant, this is the station called Mariko. And this restaurant actually is still there. It's a modern building these days. It doesn't look the same. And they have a sign. They have some pictures in their website. They're really proud of being in Hiroshige's series. And they have some pictures, you know, showing their history when they used to look like this and stuff like that. And at the time they made their English website, they put a picture up and the guy who's running it now, his grandmother was alive. I think she has since passed away because this is missing from their site now. 
and the part of the website says this that the grand the guy's grandmother who is still alive is this baby on the back when they work out the dates when Hiroshige must have been here in 18 30, was it 1832? I don't remember the dates. The grandmother would have been a little baby in 1832 and they had a picture of her in the shop in, in 1950 or something like this. So this is a real place. It looks like we've got some incipient foxing here. I'm not sure. Look at this. We've got traces of foxing or mold starting to come, I think. We've got to get this thing out of this package and dried out. Yeah, it's a nice set. I'm happy. We got a good deal. I don't know at the point at this point what we paid for it. watanabe san has been doing a lot of the buying here. So I don't know. I don't know what we paid for it and I don't know what we'll be doing with it. After inspection is over. If it turns out that the lots of them are foxed, then there's no, no doubt we just break up the set. There's nothing we can do with it if most of them are foxed and damaged. And the remaining good prints go into the shop as single items for tourists to pick up. These are clean. Look at them this it's so nice look at the mountain here some of the yuyudo prints are really not nice but this set is nice i'm very happy we might have a winner here we never know you know you start opening packages and going through it oh here we are look 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 i knew it was too good to last here we are boom Look at this. <coughs> Look at this. Look at this. It's this one's from the washi. Sometimes when we see the foxing, you try and figure out first where did it start. And sometimes you can see there's foxing on the backing paper out in areas beyond the print and that will show you that the backing paper is the print that became foxed sometimes you see foxing only on the print and then only on the backing area in the areas where it would transfer so in this case it's not the backing paper that's caused the problem it's bad washi or sizing or the the neri the tororo eye that was put in was bad something somewhere along the way was bad so clearly this set can't go as a set as it is but what we have and what what nabisan she's on to this she has a number of sets like this very very common and she will have the ability to mix and match and it's quite possibly possible she'll be able to take this out trash it and replace it with a nice print from another set this one's out of my hands. It's going to go up to the girls upstairs and they will figure out what to do with this. There's been a bit of transfer. <coughs> some of the foxing, some of the mess, foxing or mold from that print has transferred to the backing sheet of this one. So it's now, it's now a, it's a done deal. This stuff will all be taken out of this packaging period. We will then try and put together a full set using other prints that we have in stock. There's no way to fix the foxing. We've had people here from museums, the British Museum, the Reichs Museum, the museum people themselves, the people with access to crystalline X, X spectroscopy or whatever, they still don't even know. It's not clear whether it's organic or whether it's chemical. Or the current theory, actually, current theories are that it's some, comp, uh, some connect, some, it's both. It's uh, maybe a fungus that starts something and then a chemical reaction develops in some of the leftover products that the fungus has left. Stuff like this. It's not just mold. Mold is simply organic stuff growing on the paper. There are chemical reactions with the pigments in some cases. This overall foxing, 
nobody, nobody seems to know what it is. It's rare, very rare in prints from the Edo Meiji era and Taisho. It's very, very, very common in prints of this era, 1950s, 1960s, 1970s. It's very common in Adachi prints, not so common in Takamizawa prints. And here we are, we're seeing it in a Yuyudo print. So we think it's the paper making, something to do with the paper making or the way the glue sizing goes on or something like this. I don't know. I don't know. Anyway, there we are. It's 9.30. Thank you very much. It's Saturday now. We're going to have, I think, a very busy, busy, busy day in the shop here. We'll see. I'll see you again in two more days on Monday. And if nothing else comes up to disturb it, like today, I will be tracing on the iPad, getting ready for the Hokusai publication. Thanks very much. See you in a couple of days. Great day. Is there a forecast for rain today, guys, or not? Or is it going to be Late okay? Afternoon. Late afternoon. Okay. What about tomorrow? Rain. Rain. Soka. So it's a down weekend. Last night, Asakusa was jumping. So crowded. People drinking in the streets, just having a good time. Uh, do you mean late? Last night, yeah. I Okay, I'm out of here. Thank you very much. Let's count down three, two, one. Away we go.